Hi everyone, I'm Jane, and today we're going to discuss impressionist techniques, value and composition, and underpainting. I get a lot of questions about underpainting, like what color should I use for this type of a painting, or just what's the best color to use for an underpainting in general. So stick around until the end of this video because I'm going to show you three more versions of this painting with the exact same colors. The only difference is they'll be on a smaller canvas and the underpainting color will be different. Just to give you an idea of how the underpainting can affect the finished product. And to show you that there really is no scientific formula to choosing an underpainting color. Make sure you check out the video description below for a full list of materials and hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Now let's get started. Okay, today, like I mentioned, we're gonna talk a little bit more about underpainting because I get so many questions about underpainting. And as you can see, I've got my 12 by 16 inch canvas here and I've given it an underpainting of quinacridone magenta. Now you can use quinacridone if you like. You can also pick a completely random color. You can use another color that you really like. Honestly, the reason I picked quinacridone is because I like this color and I like it for an underpainting. I like to see little points of the pink showing through my landscape. There's no magical formula to why I picked this color, other than I like it. Now I also have these little canvases. This one is cadmium yellow medium. This is cadmium red medium and cobalt blue. And I am gonna do the same painting with the same colors on these little canvases, just to give you an idea of how the underpainting can affect the finished product. Now here I have a very limited color palette and I will also be using some titanium white. And I chose this color palette because I know I'm gonna get nice dark colors with the purple and the yellow mixed together. And using the purple and the yellow will also help me get deeper, richer shades of green. And I have two different colors of blue here so I can get a wide variety of greens, some browns, all kinds of fun stuff with just these four colors. Now you can pick any colors you like. You can pick three colors, two colors, five colors, whatever. But I encourage you to then take those colors and make a little color chart with them. Now if you've never made a color chart before, you can click the little information I card right up here and it will take you to my video where I show you how to make a, a larger color chart. Let's start by sketching out our landscape. And I just have a pencil here. And this is a soft pencil, so it's gonna be quite dark. Now the first thing I wanna do is decide where my horizon is. And I think I'm gonna have my horizon be right about on the one third line here, just loosely. It doesn't have to be perfectly straight. And I wanna decide where my focal point is. Now in this painting, I've decided I'm gonna have a little barn or a house or something. So I'm gonna say that that focal point is gonna sit right about there. I wanna make sure that everything in my painting draws the eye toward that focal point. So one way I can do that is I'm gonna get my ruler, I'm gonna go from corner to corner and just draw a line. And that actually puts my focal point a little more right there and that's fine. I'm gonna put my ruler there again, right over top of my focal point Make sure I'm at about a 90 degree angle with this line. And draw another line. So to make sure everything leads the eye to there, they're all gonna follow these lines. So let's draw in our focal point first. I'm gonna have like a little house or a barn or something. Maybe a little bit smaller than that. There we go. Now I wanna make sure everything leads to that. So I know I want a road on the ground, and so these lines are almost telling me exactly how I want my road. Clearly I don't want it just in a big triangle like that, but I'm gonna generally follow those lines. So my road is gonna start right about at my little barn or house. I'm gonna bring it around. About like that. And on this side, start pretty narrow back here to indicate distance, and I'm gonna swing it around wide right here. So they don't necessarily follow those, but they generally do, and it leads to the house. 
Now I want some trees on the side. And to make our perspective correct and make sure those trees lead us to there, I'm gonna start with a tree right here. And I'm just generally kind of scribbling a shape and it's gonna end right about at that line. These are gonna be like those tall poplar trees. I'm gonna do another one over here. It's back just a little bit farther than this first one and it's not gonna be as tall. Again, just kind of a general scribbly shape and it's gonna end right about at that line. Another one even smaller. And we, it looks like we have room for one more. So see how those trees and the road are now starting to point to our house. Over here, I don't think I want a whole lot going on. Maybe just one tree, kind of about right here. It'll be a little bit of a shorter one. It's gonna end right about at that line. We can even come back here if we like and just say there's some distant trees. Yeah, let's do that and we'll connect them to this line as well. They're just kind of distant. Now this is impressionism painting and the underpainting like this, painting the background last or in conjunction with everything else, it's a very traditional impressionist technique. So whenever I do this, I get asked a lot, why did you paint the background last? It's a style choice. That's how I help myself get that impressionist look that I'm going for. Actually, let's go ahead and draw out where our shadows are gonna be as well. So all of these trees are gonna have shadows that generally come out like this. Maybe I'll have it drop down a little bit right there where it meets the road. That's gonna help the road seem like it's kind of recessed from the rest of the ground. We'll bring it straight across here, back to this side, then back up a little, and just let our shadow trail out over there. Same thing with this one. It doesn't matter where your shadows go. It really doesn't. That's another question I get asked a lot. How do I know where my shadows go? You just decide what direction you want your shadows to go and then make them go that way. The only real rule there is make sure all of your shadows go that way. So I don't wanna take the shadow of this tree down and the shadow of this tree that way. You know, make sure everything goes the same direction. So again, kind of out this way, drop it down a little bit. Still out in that same direction. It might be at too much of an angle. There we go. And back up. As things move away, remember they get smaller. So the drop down here is about a little more than a half an inch probably, but back here, it's not even a quarter of an inch, maybe an eighth of an inch. And look also, my shadows, where they taper out on the grass, is roughly at this line here. Again, leading to our house. Our house is gonna have a bit of a shadow too. It's kind of at a different, it's kind of at an angle where you might not be able to see a lot of it. We'll just kind of indicate that it might be a little darker right there. And then this side of our house is gonna be dark. Okay, now we know where all of our shadows are. Let's start blocking them in. So I'm gonna get some Diox Purple and some Cadmium Yellow Medium. And I'm probably gonna use some Matte Medium. For this painting, it's not required. You don't have to use Matte Medium. When I'm painting with heavy body paints, I actually prefer to use Matte Medium over water, but that's totally up to you. And I'm gonna use my half inch flat brush. I'm just gonna wet it in my jar just a little bit. I don't need a lot of water since I'm using matte medium. Wipe it off, but my bristles are still a little damp. Get some medium. And I'm gonna mix up a dark color. So pull out some purple quite a bit. I'm gonna use a good amount of paint here. Pull some yellow into it and just mix it until I have a nice dark color. Don't worry about getting your color exact. And I'm gonna scoop some up so if you can see, I've got quite a bit of paint loaded up on my brush here. Now because we're working impressionistically, I'm not gonna get in here like this and paint super little details. 
I'm gonna hold my brush way far back. I'm gonna stand back so I can extend my arm a bit. And for the most part here, I'm just gonna be using the corner, but I'm gonna be working loose, so it's possible I'll flip it over and use the flat part too. I'm gonna start with this large tree and just kind of start, see? Just nice and loose. Don't worry about if it gets out of control. You know, if you accidentally get it into a part of the sky that you don't want it in, don't worry about that. That's one of the beautiful parts about painting the sky last. Because if I were to paint that sky first, I'd have to be so careful with these trees to make sure that I didn't, you know, get out of control and have to repaint my sky. But because I haven't done the sky yet, doesn't matter. I can get as crazy as I want to. We'll just do all of our trees real quick. See, just kind of flicking my brush in all different directions. Make sure you keep a good amount of paint on there so you don't get very much breaking, like right here where it's starting to get kind of fuzzy. I wanna try and avoid that. And it's okay if my paint is a little thick, so you know if it's wet when I come back with the next color, that's not a big deal. Just remember, as you get farther away, your trees are gonna get a little more narrow. So I'm just not gonna put quite as much pressure on my brush. Let's fill in that dark side of our house or barn. Still holding my brush back. It doesn't matter if that's not perfect. And notice I didn't try and cover all of the quinacridone. The quinacridone is showing in all of those areas. Same with this little tree. This one might be a little bit more of a bush than a tree. We'll see what happens to them. These ones are a little bit farther back, so I'm gonna add a tiny bit of this color to them, but for the most part, they're gonna be about mid-tone because things in the distance tend not to be as dark or as saturated as things close up. So I'm just gonna kind of loosely and very lightly just apply a hint of that color in there. Let's fill in the shadows on the ground. Same way. Get it outside of that line. Don't draw a hard line there. And again, it's okay if some of that quinacridone shows through. See now, just from making those shadows angle down and then back up, that kind of pushes this row down so that it's not just flat with everything else. shadow of our little house there. Maybe a little indication of some shadows in there. Now, if our road dips down and our light source is over here, then our road is gonna have some shadow right in there. Just put a little in there and break it up. It's gonna be nice and dark right in there. Let's say where our lightest values are now. And again, just like with the shadows, the lightest values are wherever you want to put them. I am keeping just a hint of that purple in here for now. We will end up going lighter when we get to the detail phase, but I'm just gonna take this color and use this to indicate the highlights. So I wanna say, I know that my little house or barn is gonna be quite bright right there on the roof. 
my ground is gonna be quite bright right up in here. See, I'm just using like a single brush stroke. Very loose. I know this looks like psychedelic colors right now, but it actually won't. I promise it's going to look like a landscape, not like, not like a neon black light poster. Where else do I want it to be the brightest? Probably back in here. That's going to be in the distance. At the horizon. Still not worried about if I go over those trees or anything. We'll probably have a little bit of our lighter color right in here. See how I'm not worried about covering everything. I'm just really laying down a brush stroke and if it covers, it does. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. There's no need to make corrections here at all. We can even do that on our trees. So let's just indicate that we've got our highlighted area on this side of our trees on the opposite side of where our shadows are. And this tree is still a little bit wet. So it is picking up some of that first dark color and that's okay. I'm not worried about that. Bring that light color at least halfway around your tree, at least. I want you to remember that impressionism is about giving the impression of things. It's one of the reasons it's called impressionism. It's not realism, but we make things appear real really by the way we do our lights and shadows. You know, where I've got my, my highlight and my low light is gonna help give us the impression of realism. This tree I feel like is gonna be a little bit brighter because the, where we're standing, if we turn our head this way, we can see the back of these trees. If we turn our head this way, we're seeing the front of this tree where it's taking the light. So really, I'm gonna pretty much cover this tree, but still leaving some of that quinacridone and for sure some of that first dark color that I put on there. Because you'd be able to see into a tree, you know? Just because you're looking at it on the light side doesn't mean you're not gonna see any of the dark shadows on the inside. These might have a hint. We'll really worry about these distant ones later and I might end up just painting them out. Let's lay in our mid-tone. So I'm gonna get a color that's halfway between the super dark and the super light. And everything except the sky, I'm not gonna worry about the sky right now. Everything that's still quinacridone here, I'm gonna start slashing this color into. Let's go a little bit darker so I can tell the difference between it and the light area. There we go. Again, just a single brush stroke. Whatever gets covered, gets covered. Whatever doesn't, doesn't. I know that working loose like this is really hard for some of you. But I encourage you to try because it can really help open up a lot of techniques for you. And you may discover a way of painting that you really like that you never would have tried before. You know, you don't have to 
do this painting to hang up in your living room or to give to mom or you know whatever do it for yourself to get some experience sometimes just opening yourself up to a new experience a new way of painting is really all it takes to you know give you an aha moment in something else there might be some other way of painting that you're struggling with and this may seem like the furthest thing from it, but maybe if you try it, you'll see how it can help you in other ways. Okay, I think that's a good start. Now we can start adding our colors on top. Let's lay our blues out on our palette. So I've got my cobalt. This is a little bit of a lighter blue, and it's a little more on the red side than phthalo blue. Phthalo blue is very, very dark, and it's also quite green. For now, let's start working on the dark areas of our trees. So I think I'm gonna go with some phthalo blue. I'm gonna grab some of my diox. That's quite dark. And I'm gonna do the same thing, but I'm not gonna try and cover all of this dark. I'm also not worried if I go into the quinacridone, I'm not worried if I cover some of that yellow, just putting little points of this color in there. I think the more layers of colors, just like when we do other types of paintings, the more layers of colors you have in there, the richer it's gonna appear. Now here's one other thing. I know that when we blocked in our light and dark areas, we did the same colors on the ground as in the trees. We want to make sure though, that we don't really do that with these colors that we're putting over top because then the ground and the trees are all gonna be the same color at the end. We have enough different colors on our palette, even though it's limited, that we can make a wide range of colors so that the ground and the trees are different colors and stand apart from each other a bit more. So notice I'm not taking this color into the shadows on the ground. Nor am I gonna take this color into the side of this house. We'll just put a little bit of it in this tree. Don't be afraid, get it off the edge of the canvas. If it's all squished into your canvas, it's gonna look really squished into your canvas. So wipe at the edge, make sure it looks like that tree. Maybe it actually ends right about here. Let's go a little lighter. I'm just gonna grab a bit of yellow and mix it in there. So now we're starting to get green. We'll keep these trees nice and bright green. We'll kind of mute down the ground. I'm gonna do the same thing overlapping that last color I did and overlapping my yellow. And even take a little bit of it over to that side. We might have some little bits that are catching some sunlight that we can see around the edge there. I have been really enjoying painting landscapes like this for a while now. I've been doing quite a few of these over the last few weeks. In fact, if you follow me on Instagram, if you saw the little garden gnome that accidentally showed up in one of my paintings, <laughs> that was almost this exact same painting, just a smaller canvas. Same colors, same underpainting, everything. Pretty much the same composition. And every time I sit down to paint, I think, oh, I should do another one of those little landscapes. So I decided I would bring one of these little landscapes to you guys too. Don't worry if your trees start getting closer and closer. We can knock that back, get those trees back into shape when we paint the sky. I would rather have the freedom to make my trees look the way I want them to look right now though, not have to worry about it. This one's gonna have more of that green. 
I'm almost covering all of that purple. I'm going right over it. But see, there's still little bits of it showing. I'll just put a hint of it in these trees here. Let's go lighter. I'm just mixing in the yellow now rather than over here so I can make sure that it gets nice and light. And we're gonna come even farther over to this side. See, just little scratches. Sometimes when I do this, I'll show you what I'm imagining. So I'm not going to my tree and going dot, 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 dot. That's not what I'm doing. And I'm not scribbling like this. What I kind of do is I almost pretend like I'm writing really quickly in really fancy cursive. So I kind of come into here, with the edge of my brush and you know, like that, dot an I once in a while, cross a T once in a while, down to the next line. That's what I'm doing. Of course, you know, on our trees, I'm kind of doing it in a downward fashion, but that's what I'm doing, not dot, 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 dot. So see if that helps. Pretend you're writing really quickly in really fancy cursive. And notice I am still holding my brush quite far back. I'm about done with my trees for now. See, I'm not even drawing trees back here. I'm just saying there's something back there. And just by putting the light and the dark and everything on there in a layered way, similar to these trees, it's gonna tell your eye they're trees. They're back in the distance. They don't need detail. Okay, let's get started working on our ground. So like I said, we want the ground to be a different color than the trees so that the trees in the ground don't kind of get lost in each other. So I used the phthalo blue in the trees. I'm gonna use the cobalt blue for the ground. So let's get a little bit of yellow, mix it in with our cobalt, mostly on the side of cobalt. And I wanna darken it a bit because I'm gonna fill in my shadows first. So I'm gonna get some of my diox and throw that in there. Nice dark color. So I'll start here at the base of my tree. Same type of brush strokes as when we did the trees. Throw a little more diox in there. Cobalt tends to be a little light of a color, so I don't feel like it's getting quite as dark as I want it. Let's try that. That's a little bit better, I think. the shadow of our little barn or house in there and our shadow will start doing that on the road here and I'll lose the edge of that tree shadow and that's perfectly okay 
Mix up some more of my colors. Ooh, grabbed a little much yellow there. See, super messy. My brush is so glopped up with paint right now. And I'm okay with that. See what a mess my brush is. <laughs> That's okay. I don't want a hard line there, so I'm just breaking up that line. Now add just a hint of it in here. Maybe a hint of it back in here. Let's lighten that a bit. Just grab some more yellow. See, again, short. It's just like a, a touch and a little bit of a push in one direction or the other. You can even come in there and put a little window in your tree. You know, your tree might have a break in it somewhere up here and a little poke of light might be showing through it in the shadow on the ground. Try and keep this to where you put your mid-tone color before. But if you lose your highlight, that's fine. That's the next part. Let's push that in just a little there. All right, let's go lighter. I'm just gonna mix it right here in my yellow. We haven't even used white yet. I promise we'll use some white when we start kind of working on the details. We're still not working on details. Get a bit of that dappled into there. So see, we've got these cool muted colors everywhere. And then that bright, hot underpainting underneath showing through is helping create some interest. And I don't know about you, but I'm actually really liking that hot pink sky. <laughs> I kind of want to leave it like that. I'm, I'm super tempted to say, all right, the sky in this painting is hot pink. I don't know, we'll see. We'll see how I feel once we, once we get there. All right, I put out a little fresh yellow and some titanium white, and I'm gonna go down to my number eight filbert because we are gonna start working on a few details. A little matte medium or water. If you're using water, that's fine. Let's add our highlights to our trees. So I'm gonna get, where is it? Just a hint, just a hint of phthalo blue. Get a nice bright yellow. It's just ever so slightly muted down. Little hint of white, just the tiniest hint of white, not much. Load up my brush pretty good. Still gonna hold it back. And we're gonna come in here to our highlight side and we're gonna really do the same type of thing. Get our highlights on there. Little pokes of that bright color. It can extend over into the darker area. It can peek out from over here. A 
again. I'm still writing in cursive. Don't squish your tree over into the canvas. Like I said with this one over here, make sure this one is extending off. We wanna make it look like this tree, it maybe ends right about here off of the canvas. Impressionist painting is really all about what's called mark making, how you make marks with your paintbrush. There's not a right and wrong mark. So if the marks that I make don't work for you, figure out what your mark is. The more I paint like this, the more I realize that I do that, the little, you know, cursive writing type thing. That's kind of my my impressionist mark that I make. You know, like Van Gogh's was the little, the little slashes, very patterned, very regular. I can't do that. I've tried. That just doesn't work for me. I'm much more scattered in every aspect of my life. <laughs> Not just painting. I'm kind of scattered. See, I'm getting into that sky, I don't care. I'd rather make my tree a little bit too big so that I know exactly where it is and have the option of taking away whatever I don't want. If anything gets to be too much, if you get too much yellow, that's okay. Just put some of your darker color back over it. Back here in the distance, remember our brush strokes are gonna start getting a little bit smaller. Just not putting quite as much pressure on my brush. I feel like that far left tree needs a little bit more. It's not quite as bright as the others. And this one, this one's gonna have quite a bit. See, I'm almost just scribbling. Don't get in here and start doing, you know, don't do that. See now how these colors look different than the ground colors. So our tree isn't gonna get lost in the ground. I don't think I want it that light at the bottom of that tree. Let's pull a little more phthalo, a little diox to mute it. Actually, let's wipe that off. Too much yellow. See, change anything you want at a moment's notice. Let's work on our house a little bit. We've kind of neglected it for a few. We'll start on the dark side, so I've got my diox yellow mixture, mostly diox. I think I am gonna throw, let's throw a little hint of cobalt in there. To cool it off a little bit more, since it's our shadow side. I'm just gonna come in here from the edge, down and down that edge. That's really it. You can still see that first color. You can still see the quinacridone underneath. It just kind of gave it a little bit of a different tone in a few places. And I think I'm actually gonna grab a bit of cobalt in there. There, that's exactly what I wanted. Let's do that same mixture, throw a little extra yellow into it. We're gonna do our mid-tone side. 
little hint of the cobalt. That might be too close to the color we already have there. That's a little lighter. Oh, you know what I forgot? I forgot to put our dark shadow under the eave here. And just kind of pull it down a bit. A little more yellow, maybe a hint of white. Gray it down a bit. More white, a little more yellow. Very warm, very light. I'm just making up these color decisions as I go, you guys. See, didn't fill it in all the way at all. Just gonna pick up a tiny bit of white and really pop that right there. And I thought it would be fun to add a hint of that little lighter color on the one side. And now I've decided I absolutely don't like that. So we're going to go back into this mixture and get rid of it. There. Let's put just a tiny speck of white right along this edge here. I will probably come back and adjust my house later on. Let's work on the ground. I'm gonna take a little bit of diox, all on its own. And let's just put a few little points of it into the shadows, just like in the areas that we think would be the darkest, so around the base of the tree here. Same little writing and cursive mark, stopping about at the road. The shadow of the house here, and then down in the road. Just little bits. I'm not covering everything. And this diox, because it's dark, but it's also the complement to the yellow, when we start really putting the yellow in the ground here for the brightest parts, it's going to make this diox seem very, very dark. Still just working on that same load, putting a good amount of pressure on my brush just to get off the little bits that I can. I want to bring a little bit more life into the color on the ground. I like the muted for underneath, but I don't want to finish with real muted colors. So I'm going to avoid putting any purple into these mixtures from here on out. I'm going to go mostly cobalt with some of the cadmium yellow. We'll start kind of laying it in here. Again, cursive writing or whatever mark it is that you are comfortable with. But I'm being quite random with it. Just deciding it needs to be right there and putting it there. And I think that this is a fairly simple painting. You know, it's just, the hardest part about it is loosening up if you're not used to working loosely. 
And, you know, just like anything else in art, it takes practice. It's going to take you some time to be able to paint loose. It's something that I'm always working on. I want to be able to paint very loosely. And sometimes I do a pretty good job of it, and sometimes not so much. See, I can start coming in here now and cutting around this tree. If I feel like the tree got too big, I just cut parts of it off with this color. Right there, gone. Using the edge of my brush back here where it's more in the distance. Cut into my tree a little bit there too. So if painting loose is you know, something that you want to be able to do, don't get frustrated. Just keep reminding yourself, you know, when you find yourself starting to choke down on your brush like this and micromanaging details intentionally, make yourself push it back, stand back so that you can extend your arm. Or push your chair back if you are one of the people who sits to paint. Just don't let yourself get super myopic you know, and get in here like that. Let's pull a little more yellow into there now. Okay, or a lot more yellow. We pulled a lot more yellow in. Into our lighter area. I'm gonna come in here and put a little highlight in that shadow. Get a little bit of the sun poking through. And I think this started out as a road. I think maybe it used to be a road. Maybe nobody's lived in that little farmhouse or used that barn or whatever it is in a very long time and the road has kind of grown over. Let's cut into that tree a bit. I feel like it got a little bit big. Same over here. I'm going to cut in there a little. Expose a bit more of the ground. More, more yellow, a little bit of white. Didn't clean off my brush, I still have that cobalt in there. It's gonna be a very pale color. And again, just wherever we feel like it's the lightest. I'm just going to make a couple of adjustments here to some of my shadows and then I think we're going to work on the sky. I did throw a little bit of purple into that yellow, kind of warm it up 
just a bit because right here, this tree, I feel like this tree is getting lost in the ground. So if I take this color that's warmer and nudge it up against that tree, it's gonna help it seem different from the ground. Of course, I do wanna put this color a little bit everywhere then. I don't want it just in that one spot that's gonna make it look weird. So maybe wherever the ground here kind of meets these trees, that's where I'm gonna put that color. See, that helps set it off a bit. I still feel like that spot is just not right. And that may happen to you. And I wanna show you that you can keep going with it. You don't have to stop and, and say, oh, I don't know what to do now. So if that tree is nice and bright, to get it to stand apart from the ground, I think we're gonna to have to go darker on the ground right there. So I've got my cobalt yellow mixture again, and we're gonna lay this in there. No, I just really hate that spot. So, we are, we're gonna take that tree out all together in this area. Bye-bye, no more tree. We'll let him start back there. He can start right there. Just kinda get rid of that. lost my shadow at the tip of my tree. That's all right, we can probably put it back in. I don't know if you've ever noticed how ugly and decrepit my poor little filbert is getting, but it's because I paint like this with it <laughs> all the time. He kind of gets scrubbed. I tend to not be very nice to my filbert. Lately, he's my most used brush. Throw some white in there. There. Oh, I'm liking that much better. See now, where the quinacridone shows through on the ground, it doesn't look like hot pink. It looks like brown. It looks like warm brown, like earth or you know something shining through. The colors change in relationship to the other colors that are near it. It's another one of the principles of impressionist painting. Okay, I am liking this so much better now that I pushed that tree off into the distance. I'm just gonna brighten it up right here. And let's paint in the sky before we do anything else. So I'm going back to my half inch and get the tiniest point of cobalt and mostly white. A little matte medium. We're gonna come in, start down here at the horizon and start cutting around our trees. Remember, you can take away anything that was too big, too much, whatever. And that little point of matte medium I put on my brush 
is keeping my paint very transparent in some places and allowing it to be more opaque in others. Let's really cut that in there. And again, I'm just doing a brush stroke and letting it cover whatever it covers and leave exposed whatever it leaves exposed. You can even come into like a really dark spot there and put a little touch of the white. Maybe there's a tiny little break in the tree and the sky is showing through. straight line there at the top of my roof. My roof was not straight before, had a little bit of a curve to it, but look, now it's straight. Same right here. using this large brush to go around these tiny areas because that helps me not micromanage. If my brush is too big to get into an area, well, then that area gets to keep the sky, that pink color showing. Get into what I can get into and I leave everything else alone. All right, from here on out, except when I'm around my trees, I'm gonna kinda use my brush like that, just flat, see? Still get in there at my trees and then scribble it out. And you know what, if you do your sky like this and you decide, whoop, I really hate that, then just come back in and fill it in. All right, I'm just gonna pop a few highlights on the ground.
Okay, I'm just gonna pop the highlights on the house or barn, whatever it is. And then I think I'm gonna put one more thin coat on the sky and I feel like I am done. So just that yellow purple mixture and some white. Nice and bright right there where it meets the darkest part of the house. Cause that's gonna help draw our eye to that area. Just a little hint of it around the edge there. A little more yellow. Make a slightly darker color, maybe just a hint of blue. And we'll just add a little pop of highlight on this edge. And I think that's really all I need to do to this little house. Still leaving that pink around the trees. Just taking away a bit of it. And this is mostly white, quite a bit of matte medium just to make it a bit transparent. I just felt like I got a little bit too much texture in my sky than I wanted. So I'm just kind of smoothing some of that out. I'm okay with how much pink is showing. If you're not, just put a heavier coat of paint on your sky than in what I'm putting on mine. I do encourage you to be bold and, you know, not cover the pink completely. Let it show. It may look weird to you right now, but it'll look really interesting. And I encourage you to look at, look at a bunch of impressionist art, you know, do a, do, do a Google search for impressionist landscape painting. And in a lot of them, certainly not all of them, but in a lot of them, you'll see some of these like wild colors kind of peeking out around corners of elements. And so that's another layer of cohesion. We talked about having cohesion in our painting earlier, you know, by the colors that we're using, but also where we've got a little bit of this pink showing out through the entire painting that adds another bit of cohesion because you can see that pink in the ground down through here. Okay, and I think I'm pretty happy with that, so I'm just gonna go ahead and sign it. And there's our Impressionist landscape. I hope you learned something new in today's video. And no matter what color you chose for your underpainting, I hope that this helped you feel a little bit more confident in selecting a color. And I hope you feel a little bit freer to experiment with underpainting. Some really exciting things can happen when you're bold and you just kind of go for some crazy color that you would never think to put underneath a painting. 
If you'd like a closer look at the four different versions of this painting that I did, make sure that you find me on Facebook and Instagram, and I'll post them there. While you're there, make sure that you share your version of this painting with me. Thank you as always for painting with me, everyone, and I'll see you next time.